Hollywood, California, Monday, April 26th. The Lux Radio Theater presents Irene Dunn and Robert Taylor in Magnificent Obsession. Lux presents Hollywood. Our stars, Irene Dunn and metro Golden mayors sensational personality, Robert Taylor, with Pedro de Cordova, Sarah Hayden, and Barbara Kent. Our guests, Dr. Lloyd C. Douglas, author of Magnificent Obsession and other best-selling novels, and John Arnold, head of metro Golden mayors camera department and president of the American Society of Cinematographers. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our conductor, Louis Silvers. On behalf of our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, Welcome to Hollywood and the Lux Radio Theater. A girl can't be too young to start guarding her complexion. There's Deanna Durbin, for instance, the girl who made an overnight hit in Universal's Three Smart Girls. She's only 14, but already she's protecting her complexion the Lux Toilet Soap way. Here's what Deanna Durbin says about this gentle soap. I like Lux Toilet Soap, too. I see all the grown-up actresses using it, and Mother says I can't begin too young to take the best care of my complexion. Grown-ups use Lux Toilet Soap to guard against cosmetic skin, dullness, tiny blemishes, and large pores. Its active lather removes cosmetics thoroughly, keeps skin clear and smooth. Try it for yourself and see. And now, our producer, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. From boyhood to the moment that Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer discovered him in Pomona College, it was the ambition of Robert Taylor to follow in the footsteps of his physician father. Today, though perched on the highest pinnacle of motion picture stardom, Bob still attends medical lectures and believes that medicine is the finest career in the world. It's something of a coincidence, therefore, that this amazingly popular young actor should have made his first marked success on the screen as a physician first in Society Doctor, then in tonight's play, Magnificent Obsession. Bob's father was a country doctor who left his son little more tangible than his books and a creed of life. But Bob has clung to that creed in spite of the world that has spun him steadily higher to international fame. Written by Hugh Walpole, the words are, Blessed be all sorrows, torments, hardships, endurances that demand courage. Make of me a man to be ready for everything. Love, friendship, success. To take it if it comes, to care nothing if these things are not for me. Make me brave. Magnificent Obsession was written by Dr. Lloyd C. Douglas, who speaks to us later. Playing opposite Robert Taylor, currently seen in personal property, and whom we hear shortly as Bob Merrick, is Irene Dunn in the role of Helen Hudson. Great actresses are rarities, but Miss Dunn is a rarity among great actresses. Superb in drama, brilliant in song, she has in the last few months shown the world a brand of refreshing comedy which has proved her one of Hollywood's most versatile divinities. From the original screencast, we bring you Sarah Hayden in the role of Nancy Ashford, while Barbara Kent is heard as Joyce Hudson and Pedro de Cordova as Randolph. We welcome our international audience and the crowd that waited for hours on Hollywood Boulevard to attend tonight's play. The doors close, and the curtain slowly rises as the Lux Radio Theater presents Irene Dunn and Robert Taylor in Magnificent Obsession. Dr. Wayne Hudson, an eminent brain specialist, died one midsummer evening. Died by drowning in the lake near his sanatorium. His death was a shock to the world, especially to those in the field of medicine. It's late at night now, and we're in an office of the sanatorium. Deeply conscious of a great loss, Nancy Ashford, the head nurse, is speaking to one of the younger girls. The routine of the hospital will go on as usual. Dr. Hudson would have wanted it that way. 
Yes, Mrs. Ashford. Have the other nurses take their regular room assignments for the night. Tell them to be especially careful not to disturb the patients. Yes, ma'am. Or Evelyn. I can't help it. Everyone loved him so. He was so kind. I know, dear. But we have a hospital to take care of. Patients who need us. Yes, ma'am. I want you to take room 417 tonight. Robert Merrick? Yes. I won't. I can't. Evelyn. It was his fault Dr. Hudson died. It was all his fault. You don't know what you're saying. I do. If we'd had the pull motor for the doctor, he'd have lived. But we didn't have it. It was being used. Stop it. It was on the other side of the lake being used to save Bob Merrick. Bob Merrick! Evelyn, stop it. He lived. And the doctor had to die. You mustn't feel that way. It wasn't Robert Merrick's fault. It wasn't anyone's fault. I know you feel badly. We all do. It's just the way things happen sometimes. Mrs. Hudson? Yes? My name is Perry. Well, how do you do, Mr. Perry? I've been expecting you. Sit down, please. I dislike coming so soon after the funeral, oh, but... It's quite uh, all right. Business matters can't wait very well, can they? Well, no, especially this one, Mrs. Hudson. Yes. Well, Mr. Perry. Oh, what? Uh, Forgive me, please. I had no idea you were so young. I was my husband's second wife. We'd only been married a short while. Yes, I know. I have a stepdaughter, only a year younger. But go on, please. Well, as you probably know, Mrs. Hudson, I was your husband's financial advisor. And since his death, I've been going over the books very carefully. You know, uh, it seems almost incredible, Mrs. Hudson, but there's very little left. I see. He never kept much of a balance at the hospital. Everything was transferred to his personal account. But look at these withdrawals. Cash, $5,000. Cash, 2000 Cash, 10000 Have you any idea what these were for? My husband was always a very generous man. You mean he gave this money away? Well, I don't know the details. But scores of people have been coming here to the house. And they all tell me the same story. At some time in their lives, my husband befriended them, helped them, gave them money. When they tried to pay him back, he refused to take it. He said he couldn't take it back, that he had used it all up. Used it all up? Well, that's strange. What did he mean? I don't know. No one seems to know. Helen? Oh, yes, yes. What is oh. it, Joyce? Mrs. Ashford has to go back to the hospital. She's leaving now. Oh, I thought she was staying... Will you excuse me, Mr. Perry? Of course. Who is he, Helen? His name is Perry. He had something to do with your father's finances. Oh. Helen, I wanted to say goodbye. Oh, yes, of course, Nancy. I'll drive up to see you soon. I hope so. Oh, here, before I forget, I've got a letter for you. Oh, thank you, dear. It came to the hospital this morning. I thought I'd better bring it out. Joyce, it's another one. Another? Yes, listen. I was a friend of your husband's. He helped me once, many years ago, but he would never let me repay him. If ever I can be of service to you, do not hesitate to call on me. It's signed, Randolph. Randolph. I don't think I ever heard Dad mention him. I can't take it back. I've used it all up. What? Nancy, did you ever hear Dr. Hudson say anything like that? I can't say I have. Dear, if I only knew what it meant. Well, I've got to hurry. They've just called me again. What's the matter? Is there anything wrong with the hospital? Oh, it's that young idiot, Bob Merrick. He's having another tantrum, mm -hmm. threatening to leave. I should think you'd be glad to get rid of him. And I think if it hadn't been for him, the greatest heart that ever beat in this world would be beating tonight. Well, I hate him. I hate him. I hate him. Look, nurse, I don't want to be inquisitive, but what's this on my breakfast tray? It's a poached egg. The doctor ordered it. Yeah, why didn't he eat it? Please, Mr. Merrick. It's the same breakfast we serve all the other patients. Sure, that's why they're still in here. I've been in five weeks, but I'm hanged if I'll stay another. Get back in that bed. Mrs. Ashford. Oh, Mrs. Ashford. Mr. Merrick. Hiya, toots. Where are my pants? You can go, Evelyn. Yes, ma'am. Get back into that bed, please, or I'll have to call the house doctor. I want to be discharged. I'd love to be the first to pack you off. But your temperature is 101. Your pulse beat is abnormal. You're still very weak. And your grandfather, who pays all the bills, would be furious. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll compromise. Bring me a highball. It'll raise your fever. Oh, tell me, Warden, what do they give nurses instead of a heart? An ice bag. You know, I can believe that. 
Hey, Mrs. Ashford, you look like a pretty good sport. I want to ask you something. And I want you to ask yourself the same question. Is it my fault that my life was saved and Dr. Hudson was drowned? How did you... The nurses were under strict orders. Oh, no, 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 no. They didn't tell me. They're not that human. But I have eyes and ears. What I want to know is, is it my fault they were using their lung machine on me when they, they needed it for him? Of course not. But the staff has been under a strain. They loved and honored Dr. Hudson. We all did. I know. You're asking yourselves what right I have to be alive and Dr. Hudson dead, isn't that so? Well, then, what right have you or anyone else to pass judgment on what kind of people have a right to live? That's true. If such an attitude has pre prevailed in this hospital, you have a right to be indignant. No, I'm not indignant about that. I'm indignant because I feel the same way. What? Sure. I know I'm not worth anything, let alone a great man's life. It's a darn shame the wrong guy had to go. <laughs> there it is. We all have to make the best of it. He's dead. I'm alive. We're both out of luck. Please, Mr. Merrick. You mustn't talk like that. Well, it's true, isn't it? <laughs> now that I've apologized for being alive, what about having me pardoned so that I can get out of here? I'm sorry, but you can't leave yet. Is that final? Final. You'll regret this, Mrs. Ashford. You'll regret it more if you leave. I'll come and see you again this evening. Final, huh? Hmm. Hello. I want Elm 302. What? It's my house. Can't I speak to my own butler? Well, I have some rights around here. All right, then. Come and see me this evening. Hello? Hello, Horace. Now, look, Horace, this is Mr. Merrick. I want a car. A car, an automobile. Yes, I want it left at the gate of the hospital. Well, sure, I'm leaving. Yes, I thought you'd like to be the first one to know, Horace. Now, listen, bring me a suit and a shirt and a pair of shoes and leave them in the car. Horace, come on, stop loafing. I want to get as far away from Brightwood Hospital as I can. Sorry, sir, but there seems to be a car stopped in the middle of the road up ahead. Oh, yes, and a damsel standing beside it. A damsel in distress, Horace. Shall I stop, sir? Well, how can I tell yet? Let me get a good look at her. Very good, sir. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's the matter with you, Horace? Don't you know beauty when you see it? Good evening. Can I be of any assistance? I'm afraid I'm so. Well, you picked a nice spot. I think you've managed to find the last unpaved road in Westchester and the exact spot farthest from a service station in either direction. Oh, I was afraid of that. What's wrong? Well, I haven't the vaguest idea. How about gas? No, it's not that. I just had the tank filled before I left town. What town? Well, New York, naturally. You're from New York? Well, now, isn't that a coincidence? So am I. Isn't it a small world? Really, I would like to get this car started. Do you think you could do something to make it go? Well, now, let me see. Let me see. Anything I can do, sir? Yes, that's an idea. Excuse me a moment, will you? Of course. A Horace. Yes, sir. Find a service station and take your time. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. Well, that ought to fix it. Is your man going for help? Yes. And in, in the meantime, isn't there, isn't there anything you could do? Well, I, I, I don't know now. Um, um, how about taking out the spark plugs? Taking out the spark plugs? Well, you never can tell. I've heard certain mechanics say... Your car will never be sound till you've had all the spark plugs removed. You know, the spark plug is the appendix of a motor, an unnecessary thing. Have out your spark plugs now while your car is still in the pink. Don't wait for it to break down completely. Oh, I see. Oh, but I really have an appointment. Couldn't you do something? Maybe if you pushed it, it might kind of catch on. <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit it, but I don't know a thing about motors. What do you say if we just sit here by the road and talk till a man comes back? Huh? Well, I... I wasn't exactly counting on an evening of conversation in the open air. Oh, but what could be nicer? Where could you find a more completely charming spot than this? Look at that moon up there. I'll bet it's never been so round or so radiant as it is tonight. <laughs> it is exquisite, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Exquisite. The moon. Oh, yes, yes. I, I love nature. If you ask me, you were lucky to break down here in the center of Eden. I was lucky to happen along. Yes, you certainly were. You've been a big help. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm... Not much help, but they tell me I'm good company. Uh, well, I'm sure of that. But you see, I'm expected somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, you know, I could like you. Really? Mm -hmm. Of course, I'd have to see lots and lots of you for a while to make sure. Oh, sure, you wouldn't want to make any mistakes. No, no, I hate divorces. 
And then there'd be the children to think of, too. What's your name? Was that important? Well, of course names are important. Suppose we didn't have them. Think of the mix-ups with everybody going around yelling, Hey, you! Now, mine's Bob, if you're interested. Bob. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you're still interested, the last name's Merrick. Merrick. Sure, what's the matter? How far did you say it was to that service station? I didn't. Where are you going? I'm going to walk. Oh, now, wait a minute. You can't you do that. You let me go. Here, what's the matter with you? What Please. Did I say? Now, listen, you can't walk out on me like this. I don't even know who you are. Would you really like to know? Of course I would. My name is Hudson. Mrs. Helen Hudson. Hudson? Then you're, you're Dr. Hudson's? Yes. Well, I, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I suppose you hate me. I don't feel anything toward you. Let me go, please. Good evening. Is Mrs. Hudson in? No, sir, she's not. She still lives here, doesn't she? Oh, yes, sir. Yes. Well, then I'll wait. Oh, by the way, did you give Mrs. Hudson my note? Yes, sir. And that reminds me. I was unable to get an answer, so here's your $10 back. And the note, sir. Didn't she even open it? I don't know, sir. That's how I found it. In the wastebasket. Oh, I see. All right, thank you. The bank would like to do it, Mrs. Hudson, but I'm afraid we can't. I know I'm overdrawn, but there ought to be a check-in from the hospital soon. Then I'd advise you to wait, Mrs. Hudson. Very well. Thank you. Mrs. Hudson! Mrs. Hudson! I beg your pardon. Miracles do happen. Really? Yes, really. Here I stand looking at you. And a moment ago, I was surrendering my last delusion, vowing to hate the world forever. Well, that's very unfortunate, Mr. Merrick, that I don't see how I could prevent you from doing that. Oh, now, now, now wait, please. My car is just across the street, and I've got to speak to you. Let me take you home. No, I'm very sorry. Oh, for the love of heaven, melt, Mrs. Hudson. Unbend. Be human. <laughs> are, you, are you smiling? Are you actually smiling at oh, me? Oh, I'm on the verge of shrieking in hysteria. Well, then come on before you change your mind. sure you know where I live? Well, I ought to. I've been hanging around outside there for weeks. Months. What was it you wanted to talk to me about? Oh, uh, Mrs. Hudson, I had an amazing encounter last night. I ran into a man who preaches a theory that he learned from your husband. A theory that he learned from... Yes, from your husband. It seems that Dr. Hudson lived by theory. A profound formula for getting what he wanted out of life. <laughs> Good Lord, of course he got you. Well, if I ever doubt it. Please, what are you talking about? What is the theory? Who was the man? Well, his name's Randolph. Randolph? Randolph? Oh, yes. Yes, he's a stonecutter. Don't ask me how I met him. But we had a long talk. The theory is... The theory is quite simple. Help people and don't tell. And you get the power to do the things you want to do. When you do things for people, they can't pay you back. Is that it? Well, that's part of it. Because when they're ready to pay you... You've used it all up. Yes. Well, when this man Randolph began to talk to me, I thought he was nuts. I couldn't help trying it out, though. It didn't work at first, and and then, just when I was about to give myself a loud, bitter laugh, this happened. What do you mean, this? You're merely taking me home against my will. And it seems to me you're going out of your way. What do you mean? Did I take the wrong turn back there? Oh, somewhere. That's obvious. Now that you speak of it, this is an unfamiliar street. The street? I call this a country road. Yes, I guess you're right. Yes, sir, there's a cow. That substantiates your observation. It is a road, not a street. Oh, now, come now. I really would like to get home if you don't mind. Certainly, but aren't you interested in what I've been telling you? Yes, I am. I'm terribly interested. Well, then, can I see you again very soon? Shouldn't we do something about it, really? Well, I'll see. I can't say now. Well, there's a road we can turn back on, I think. We don't have to turn back, do we? Yes, we do. Now, there's a nice thing. Oh, What's the matter? Stop me if you've heard this one, but I think we've run out of gas. Oh, I should have known this would happen. What are you doing? I'm getting out. You're not out of gas, and I'm not in the mood for any more fooling. <laughs> ah, you're behaving just like all those indignant, old-fashioned girls in the anecdotes, the ones who walk home. Well, I am indignant. Well, at any rate, you're not bored, are you? Well, uh, well are you going to drive me home now, or aren't you? Sure, sure I am, but 
But look at the view. It's positively Arcadian. Excuse me? Oh, now, now wait. Now wait. I'll behave. Get back in the car. No. Mrs. Hudson. No. Look out! Look out! <laughs> Helen! Pick her up! Pick her up! Get, her, get away. Helen! Helen! Oh, my God. Oh, she just stepped out and rode. I tried to stop. Here, quick. Quick, help me. We've got to get her to the hospital. Yes. How long will it be, Nancy, before they know something? I don't see how it can go on much longer. She's been on the table almost two hours. Poor Helen. Why should this happen to her? What did she ever do to deserve this? Oh, Joyce, dear, you mustn't. Come in. Mr. Merrick. I've, I've been waiting outside. I had to know. How is she? How is she? You asked that. You, of all people, as if you hadn't been the cause of enough unhappiness. No, no, don't say that, please. It was an accident. An accident. Mrs. Ashford? Oh, Dr. Ramsey. Is she all right? She's going to live. Oh, thank God. But, well, I... I'm afraid she'll never see again. <gasps> Doctor. Never... Never see. Do you hear that? Never see again. The rest of her life she'll be blind. And why? Because of you. Because of you. Oh, Joyce, dear. I don't care. It's true, isn't it? Why shouldn't he suffer too? I want him to suffer. He's responsible. Go in there and look and see what you've done. <laughs> it, it is my fault. All of it. You can't make me suffer any more than I'm suffering now. You've been listening to Robert Taylor and Irene Dunn in the Lux Radio Theater's presentation of The Magnificent Obsession. Now, before we go on with our play, let's step outside to the stage door a minute. There's a blue roadster in the parking place behind the theater, and a pretty girl is in it. She seems a little annoyed. Good grief, Arlene. Where have you been? I've been honking this horn for 20 minutes. Oh, bah. I tried to get in to see Irene done without a ticket, but no luck. They're all filled up. In the fine state you've got me in, waiting. I'm going out with Bill at 7.30. Now, how am I going to make it? Phooey, you've got plenty of time. Oh, have I? I was going to take a nap. I'm dead on my feet. Gosh, I'm sorry. But look. I'll tell you something that's actually better than a nap. When I'm tired and I have a date to keep, I just slide into a warm, lathery, luxe toilet soap bath and relax. <laughs> you feel like a million when you get out. Leaves your skin so fragrant, too. Such a grand, expensive perfume. Eileen knows her beauty baths all right. The perfume of Lux toilet soap is a blend of 34 costly ingredients. Yet Lux toilet soap is so inexpensive that anyone can afford to use it freely. And here's another thing. Its active lather removes perspiration, every last trace of dust and dirt from deep in the pores. That means it makes you sure of daintiness, sure your skin is sweet. Why don't you make a Lux Toilet Soap Bath your daily beauty bath? You're sure to love this soap nine out of ten screen stars use. Mr. DeMille takes us back to our play. We continue with Magnificent Obsession, starring Irene Dunn and Robert Taylor. Months have gone by. Months during which Helen has learned to feel her way hesitantly through the darkness of her life. Months which have seen a complete change in Bob Merrick. We find him in Randolph's little cottage near the hospital. Randolph, the stonecutter, has been enlarging on a theory. The theory of Dr. Hudson's formula for happiness. Dr. Hudson was the best friend I ever had. He changed my whole life. How? Well... You see, for many years, I was just an ordinary stonecutter, mechanically hacking out blocks with a compression chisel. But now, uh, do, you, do you see this class? I put it into marble. It's been accepted by the Metropolitan Museum. Oh, well, it's beautiful. You, you say you did this just because of Dr. Hudson and his theory of his? His theory is a fact, my boy. A formula, precise and definite. You find people who need help, and you give them help. You mean money? Money is all right, and since you happen to have a lot of it, but other kinds of help are apt to be better still. But it must be given with absolute secrecy, and you must never let anybody repay you. 
<laughs> I'm afraid it's way beyond me. Oh, well, it's really very simple. You've probably heard it many times. Now, in this Bible here, there's a page... The Bible? Oh, oh, I don't think I... It's only a single page. Oh, I won't point it out to you. You must discover it for yourself. But the man whose life is recounted here by those who knew him was the one who originated this science of generating human power. And so successfully did he practice it that he is more alive today, burning in the hearts of men, than he was over 1,900 years ago when they nailed him to a cross. Well, then if, if I help people and I never let them repay me, I can have anything I want? If you know what you want, my boy. Oh, yes. Yes, I know what I want. I want someone, and I want a helper, too. <laughs> it complicates things, doesn't it? got to do something, Nancy. She can't go on like this, always in darkness. We've been doing things, Bob. There's somebody who can help her. There must be. If necessary, we'll comb the world. As a matter of fact, we were talking today about a man under whom Dr. Hudson studied. Dr. Brimmer. You think he could do something? There's a chance. Well, then get him, Nancy. We can't do that. He's in Berlin. Then she must go to him. She must go at once. Mm, that's not as simple as it sounds. It's very expensive. You can't stop on account of money. I can take care of that. Always ready to work your money miracle. Aren't you, Bob? What else about a Walter? Nancy, do you think I could see her just once? I don't know. She wouldn't have to know who it was. I just, I just want to see her again. Well? She's teaching herself to read through her fingers. She takes a book to the park. She's there alone every morning. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> If you will but be mine, you shall dine on cherry pie and drink nice currant. Oh. You, you dropped your book. Oh, thank you. I, I didn't know anyone was sitting near. Have you been here long? Not so very. I've been reading nursery rhymes. I'm a little embarrassed. You see, I've, I've got to learn my ABCs all over again. Is it so hard? No, not when you get the hang of it. I rather enjoy it. Well, it won't be long until you'll be reading Shakespeare, Shelley, Schopenhauer. They have them all, you know. Really? How do you know? Well, I... I'm interested in the Braille system. Oh, are you a doctor? Yes. Well, that is, that's what I started out to be, but... I haven't done much with it since I left college. Oh, what a pity. I can't help wondering why you didn't go on with it. Oh, I don't know. Unless I thought there were enough second-rate doctors in the world already. Well, why not be a first-rate one? No, there's so few of them. But what, I, what I wanted to say is, I have a friend who has a large library of Braille books. I know he'd be happy to let you have them. May I bring some tomorrow? <laughs> oh, well, I hardly think tomorrow. Right now I have my hands pretty full with Mother Goose. <laughs> yes, of course. But I'll see you again. There's yes. lots of time. Yes. Uh, what did you say your name was? Uh, Robert. Dr. Robert. Yes. Well, thanks for your interest, Dr. Robert. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Is Mrs. Hudson in? Who shall I say is calling, please? Oh, it's not important. I just wanted to know how she was. Is that Dr. Robert, Susan? Come in, please. Oh, I don't think I'd better. I would... Is Miss Joyce Hudson at home? No, sir. She's not in. Oh, well... In the living room, Doctor. Thank you. Dr. Rob. Oh, now, please don't get up. I recognize your voice. Well, I was just passing. I thought I'd drop in and find out what's been keeping you indoors. You been ill? No, no. Joyce had to go to New York on business for me, and she made me promise I wouldn't go out while she was away. <laughs> well, come on, sit down. My, I'm glad you've come. The most wonderful things have been happening... Really? I'm glad to hear it. Y you remember those bonds I told you about? The ones I thought were worthless? Yes. Well, they weren't. They're terribly valuable. And somebody's bought them from me. I don't know who. Anyway, Mr. Perry's invested the money in something else. Something that will give me an income for the rest of my life. Oh, that's fine. But that's not all. Listen to this. I'm going to Berlin. Are you? 
Yes, there's a man there, a Dr. Brimmer. He's going to look at my eye. Of course, I could never afford to pay him. I suppose he's doing it as a tribute to what my husband stood for in the medical profession. Anyway, Nancy said it would be very ungrateful of me to refuse. Re- refuse? You're not thinking of refusing. Well, I have been a little. You see, I've had so many disappointments, and of course, if he agrees with the others that there's no hope... Oh, but he won't. A man like Brimmer doesn't have disappointments. He'll be able to give you back your sight. I'm sure of it. Oh, I hope you're right. For the sake of all those who've been so interested in me. For my own part, sometimes I... I think I've gained more than I've lost through my blindness. Gained? Mm-hmm. Things so fine and sensitive that I... Well, I never even knew they were there before. Your friendship, for example. If I hadn't been blind, I might have missed that. Has it meant so much to you? So much. Oh, I wish I deserved to have you say such a beautiful thing to me. You do. You might think differently if you saw me. How could I? It wouldn't matter what you looked like. I see better now than I used to, really. I used to see only people's faces. Now I look into their hearts. Oh, but here, I'm getting maudlin. <laughs> you, you'll still be the same kind friend. You won't change. I mean, if my trip is successful. No, I won't change ever. <laughs> Oh, it's Joyce. Oh, I think I'd better go. Oh, no, no, please. Uh, in here, Joyce. Oh, I want you to meet her. She's heard me talk about you so but much. Really? Uh... I just came. Oh, Joyce, darling. This is my friend, Dr. Robert. How do you do? Dr. Robert? What's wrong, dear? Are you the man who's been meeting Helen in the park, helping her to read, seeing her home? Well, I tried to help a little. Joyce, what is it? Do you know Dr. Robert? No. No, I've never seen Dr. Robert before in my life. All ashore that's going ashore. All ashore that's going Oh, goodbye, Joyce. Goodbye, Helen, dear. Goodbye, darling. Nancy, are you sure he hasn't come? Dr. Robert, I... I don't see him. Oh, perhaps he couldn't make it. Perhaps. I must go. Goodbye. Goodbye, Nancy. Bon voyage. What is it? The American papers, Fräulein. Thank you. Who is it, George? Just the hotel boy. Helen, what are you doing up? You promised me you'd try to get some sleep. I couldn't sleep. I'm not tired. Darling, you've been through such a lot. The doctor said... Yes, yes, I know. What does it matter what the doctor said? I don't need sleep. Oh, I don't know what I need. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. I'm just not myself. I know. You're all unnerved. All this way to Berlin, all these weeks and... Yes, for nothing... Even Brimmer can't help me, Joyce. I'll get you some hot milk. It'll put you to sleep. If it only would. I'll only be a minute, darling. (laughs) Come in. Who is it? Who is it, please? Is there someone there? Helen. Who is it? Is it Dr. Robert? Yes, dear. Oh, is it really you? I can't believe it. I hope you'll forgive me for just dropping in like this. Forgive you? How did you happen to come here? When you weren't at the boat, I didn't think I'd ever see you again. I had to see you, Helen. You didn't come all the way to Berlin just to see me. Yes. Are you glad? Glad. It seems as though you must have known how much I needed you. Has it been so bad? Days and days of waiting. And at last to learn, there's no hope. I'll never see again. Oh, no. No, don't say that. You're going to see with my eyes. That's why I came. Listen. You called me a friend once. Will you let me think you meant it? Will you let me sit with you, ride with you, be hands and eyes to you? Because I've nothing else to do the whole rest of my life but help you see whatever you want to see. Will you? Well, I couldn't be a burden to you. A burden. <laughs> If I ever did a good deed in my life, if I ever thought a good thought, I'm rewarded now. 
if you'll let me. We'll forget all about doctors, shall we? Except me. <laughs> I'm not much of a one. We'll start with Paris. Do you know Paris? Have you ever been there before? No, but I've always imagined it. Well, you're going to see it now. In London and Copenhagen and Switzerland. All the world, Helen. Oh. Through my eyes. Oh. <laughs> red. You've won again, darling. 20 francs on the red. Dr. Robert. Are people staring at me? Well, now, why wouldn't they? In Paris, they make a business of staring at loveliness. Oh, darling. <laughs> There's a crowd in the cafe, Helen, and tables with gaudy check claws. Uh, Momart, I've dreamed of it. It's yes. thrilling. And there's, there's all Paris. Paris from the top of the hill, stretched out at your feet. Like a jeweled mantle. Yes. I can almost see it. Happy? Very. A moment like this on such a night. Could anyone say anything against the world? I couldn't. You couldn't hate anyone, could you, on such a night? No. You could forgive anyone, anything? I think so. Helen, could you... Could you forgive Bob Merrick? Yes. I forgave you long ago. You've known? I've thought so. At times, lately I was sure. Helen, I love you. You know that too, don't you? It's wonderful that you care enough for me to be so kind. I know now what you've done for me. Everything. About the money. The doctor's. Well, it was only because I love you so much. You care for me, don't you, a little? Hmm. You know I do. Then let me be with you always. Marry me, Helen. Marry you? And have you pitied because of me? No, don't say that, darling. Life with you is what I want. It's all I want. We'll be two of the happiest people in the world. Hmm. I'm sure we ought to be. Oh, darling. How can I ever repay you for all this? <laughs> you can, darling. I've used it all up. What did you say? You've used it all up. No, it's, it's nothing. <laughs> Ellen, there's, there's something I want to tell you. Something that'll make you laugh, I guess. Do you, do you remember that day in the park, the day you took me to be a doctor? <laughs> I remember. Well, that day I decided to be a doctor. To become what you'd mistaken me for. And I've been doing it. I've been studying again. You've been... And you thought I'd laugh at that. Oh, my dear, that's wonderful. <laughs> well, I'm going to try. There's no harm in that, is there? Oh, and you'll succeed. I know you will. Well, I'm going to stay in Europe and work. And with you to help me. Help you? We'll be together, darling. That's the greatest help in the world. What are you thinking of? Nothing, dear. We will be together, won't we? Of course. Let's go home, shall we, darling? Excuse me, is this the ticket office? Oui, mademoiselle, the Travelers Bureau. Yes, that's what I need. Now, I'd like a ticket on the boat train to Cherbourg, please, and a passage on the first steamer to America. Oui, mademoiselle. Will you sign your name on this, please? No, I'm sorry. If you'll just place my hand exactly where I'm to sign. Mademoiselle? Yes, I, I can't see. Oh, pardon, mademoiselle. Now, you'll have to furnish me with a guide of some sort. That can be arranged, can't it? Of course, but... Is Mademoiselle traveling alone? Yes, I'm traveling alone. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMX Los Angeles, the voice of Hollywood. Robert Taylor and Irene Dunn continue with Magnificent Obsession shortly. But now it's our privilege to present in the Lux Radio Theater Dr. Lloyd Douglas, the author of this great story. Dr. Douglas, a minister for 30 years, became famous for sermons of extraordinary pictorial character. 
Then he turned novelist, and from his pen have come Magnificent Obsession and Green Light, both national bestsellers. It's now my honor to extend the stage of the Lux Radio Theater to New York City. From Hollywood, I welcome and introduce Dr. Lloyd Douglas, who will speak to you from New York. Good evening, Mr. DeMille, and thank you. I appreciate being asked to contribute to this program. I feel indebted to Miss Dunn and Mr. Taylor for their sympathetic and artistic interpretation of this book. And I'm also indebted to the Lux Radio Theater for wanting to pay this tribute to my story. Magnificent Obsession, while in no sense a tract, was not written solely for entertainment. It is a purpose novel. The book had a peculiar history. In 1928, while I was still in the pulpit, I became possessed of an idea that seemed to demand a wider hearing than I could give it through that medium and resolved to put it into a story. Amateur novelists often rig up a plot dealing with things they know almost nothing about, so I did that. My story involved brain surgery, and what I didn't know about that was a plenty. For instance, in the story I wrote that Helen was in an accident and struck blind. That was easy, but to explain it, I had to call up a brain specialist and ask him where she had been hit. Casting about at random for names of my characters, I called one of the young surgeons whom I was sending abroad to do some scientific research, Dr. Dawson. I chose the name mostly because I knew no Dawsons. After the book had been out some months, my daughter Virginia met a young surgeon in Paris who was over there engaged in scientific research. Later she married him. His name was Dawson. This novel brought me a great deal of mail, letters from all sorts of people. Invariably, what they wanted to ask was this. What can I do to build up my personal fitness by improving the personal fitness of others? Is it true that what I do for other people must be kept absolutely secret or the thing won't work? Do you believe this yourself or were you just writing a story? And then I would tell them quite honestly that I wasn't just writing a story for the sake of the story and that the thing would work if they gave it a fair chance. Hundreds wrote that they had tried it and found it practical. They were always careful not to say exactly what they had done, for that would have been telling. Perhaps you may want to try it sometime. Goodbye. Dr. Douglas, you have our thanks. We're back now on our stage in Hollywood, where Irene Dunn and Robert Taylor resume the story of Magnificent Obsession. Six years have passed. Helen Hudson, hidden away from the world and her friends, has been living in quiet obscurity in a small Virginia town. But her health has gone, and we find her now in a tiny hospital room where the nurse has been reading her a newspaper article. Go on, please. You mustn't excite yourself. Oh, I must hear the rest of it. Very well, but please don't try to move. When Dr. Robert Merrick returns to America next month, he brings with him the keenest surgical mind in the field of medicine. In six short years, his work has uncovered a startling array of new medical facts, dealing particularly with surgery of the brain. Oh, I don't think we should read any more. He's done it. I knew he would. I told him oh, he would. please. And now he's coming back. Dr. Robert. Dr. Robert Merrick. <laughs> Yes, Nancy. There he is. Bob. Bob. Over here, Bob. Nancy. <laughs> Joyce. Oh, Bob, I'm so glad to see you. No more than I am to see you. Where's your luggage? Oh, it's on its way to the hot hotel. Hotel? You're coming home with us. Come on, the car's over here. You'll never know how proud we are of you, Bob. <laughs> oh, Nancy, you're a flatterer. We've all been basking in your reflected glory. You see, we like to think that you sort of belong to us. Oh, I do, Joyce, Nancy. You're my real friends. Oh, if you hadn't met me at the boat, I swear it wouldn't have seemed like a homecoming at all. It almost seems like old times. Yes. No. No, it isn't. Nothing will ever be like old times until I know where Helen is. You've never heard anything, Bob? No. And you? Nothing. We would have let you know. Yes, of course. Well, 
Welcome home, Dr. Merrick. Thank you, Keller. Is Dr. Merrick's room ready, Keller? Yes, ma'am. Oh, there's a gentleman to see you, sir. Already? <laughs> the price of fame. He's in the living room, sir. Excuse me, Joyce. Nancy. Of course. Dr. Merrick. Yes? I'm glad to see you back again. It's almost as though you've been sent, as you were sent to me before. Well, I'm afraid I... I, I I'm sorry. You don't remember me? My cottage. You came there and we... Oh, yes, of course. Oh, I knew I'd... Uh, you're the... Uh, the the stonecutter. Of course. Randolph. Of course. How do you do? It was a rather long time ago and so much has happened. Yes. You've come a long way. I never dreamed that the path I pointed out to you would lead so far. What? Oh, please don't think I want to share your glory. I was only a medium. Oh, yes, I remember. You were working on, uh, you had some, some sort of theory. Is theory? Right? Yes, expanding your personality. Getting power to get whatever you want by giving away your money. and uh, Something about a page in the Bible, as I remember it. As you remember. You mean you haven't practiced it? No. But I've heard how much you've done for people. How you've helped them. In the slums, Oh, for that, well, you see, I'd lost someone. Someone who meant a great deal to me. I was always afraid she might be alone, friendless. So whenever I put out my hand to anyone, it was with the hope that maybe someone would do the same for her. You did it for a woman. Christ did it for humanity. That's the only difference. I feel more than ever now the real purpose of my visit. What is it? Two weeks ago, I was called to Virginia to select the marbles for the state capitol. While there, I learned that the widow of an old friend of mine was in a dangerous condition, in a state of coma. The doctors say it's caused by a growth pressing upon her brain. The same growth they felt was the cause of her having been blind for many years. Blind? Who, who is she? Who is this woman? Helen Hudson. Helen? Are you sure? Nancy! Nancy! Are you sure? I'm positive. Oh, thank God. Bob! Nancy, we, we found her. We found Helen. We found her, Nancy. You'll be ready in a moment, Dr. Merrick. Let me know, nurse. Well, Bob? No, don't come near me, Nancy. We're almost ready to operate. Oh, who's going to do it? I am. Oh, Bob. Would you like to see her? She's still in a semi-coma. Come in. Helen. Helen, dear. I must. She's speaking. It's raining. It's raining awfully hard. But I must get away before the others wake up. I must hurry. Hurry. Helen. Helen. You can hear me. It's Bob. Bob Merrick. There's my pen. I want to write a letter. Joyce, Nancy, you've been so good to me. I'd only be a burden. Don't try to find me. Helen, dear, we're here. Robert. My darling Robert. I'm leaving. Leaving you. Oh, it's so hard to write when you're blind. Won't the rain ever stop? Robert, darling, it's so wonderful that you're going to be a doctor. Oh, I mustn't be in your way, a burden on you. I'm going away. My life is over now. I'm going away, alone, in the darkness. We are ready, Dr. Merrick. Dr. Merrick? Hmm? Oh, Take her into the operating room. I'll be there in just a moment. Dr. Merrick. Oh, oh, Randolph. I've been waiting for her. Is it over? Yes. She, she's all right. She'll live. And her eyes? I don't know. We haven't taken the bandage off yet. I'm going to do that now. God bless you, my son. Thank you. Oh, and Randolph. Yes? I found that, that page in the Bible. Who's there? Is someone there? Shh. Don't move, Helen. Who is it? 
Is it? Yes, dear. Oh, Robert. No. I'm going to take the bandage off your eyes. Oh. Please don't open them for a moment. Then open them slowly. Now. Helen. Can... Can you see... A ray of light. Oh, darling. Soon that ray will grow stronger. And as each day passes, we'll see more and more. Until one day... Until one day... I shall see you, my darling. We close the covers of our play, but our microphone will bring back Irene Dunn and Robert Taylor before this hour is over. Most people picture the ace Hollywood cameraman as a rough and ready sort of fellow who wears leather puttees and his cap on backward while he rushes about the studio breathing fire and carrying his camera over one shoulder. Actually, a head cameraman never operates a camera. His entire job and its artistic importance cannot be overestimated is to chart with a director the photographing of scenes and supervising lighting effects. Our guest, John Arnold, cranked his first camera for Thomas A. Edison back in 1903. Since then, he's figured in the shooting of more than a billion feet of film. And today is head of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's camera department, president of the American Society of Cinematographers, and one of the most valuable photographers the industry has ever known. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Arnold. Thank you, C.B. The biggest job a cameraman has today is to photograph the star's personalities, so to speak, as well as their faces. Will you explain why each star is a different photographic problem? Gladly. Take the matter of lighting, for instance. A star is presented at her best only through a carefully studied blend of lights, colors and shadows. A blonde appears best against soft, diffused lights. A brunette against strong, bright lights. Dark clothes do not photograph effectively against dark backgrounds, nor light clothes against light backgrounds. Contrast, remember, is what enhances beauty. Psychology also plays a big part. The cameraman studies each star and also learns what color tone blends with her personality. For example, Gene Harlow, in Making Personal Property with Robert Taylor, was filmed under white lights, which go best with her fair complexion. And Myrna Loy under violet-tinted lamps in her latest picture, Parnell, co-starring Clark Gable. Lights also have great effect in creating mood. To emphasize the somber atmosphere of Robert Montgomery's new film, Night Must Fall, we use dim lights throughout the entire picture. Well, you've heard us make the statement many times on this program, John, that nine out of ten stars use Lux toilet soap. Yes, and I know it to be a fact. Then perhaps you can answer a question asked by several listeners. If the stars have perfect complexions, why is it necessary for them to use makeup in pictures? Because a star, when playing a scene, becomes so intent on what she's doing that nature plays a little trick on her. The blood either rushes to her face or rushes away from her face. She becomes flushed or pale. With makeup, this reaction is hidden. The only ones who don't actually need makeup are a few male stars like Robert Taylor, Clark Gable, and Spencer Tracy whose natural tan takes its place. In fact, Mr. Tracy used no makeup at all in filming Captain's Courageous. I assure you, no one appreciates a fine, clear complexion more than a cameraman, for then he's able to make full use of close-up shots that would reveal the slightest flaws in skin texture if they existed, makeup or no makeup. I've recommended Lux Toilet Soap to stars and extra girls alike for years, I know of nothing better or simpler to use for keeping a smooth, healthy complexion that's always ready for even the most candid camera. Many thanks, CB, and goodbye. Thank you for your candid opinion. Each week in the Lux Radio Theater, I look forward to this moment when I can introduce our stars as their real selves. And I know you share the particular pleasure I have in inviting two such personalities as Irene Dunn and Robert Taylor back to the microphone.
Thank you, Mr. DeMille. And as for you, Bob, I want to say what a great thrill it's been to have played up session against you again. <laughs> <laughs> the story means a lot to me, Irene. As a picture, it gave me my first big break, thanks to your help, which meant just as much to me tonight as it did then. I've just learned, Bob, you're going to become a singer in your new picture, Broadway Melody of 1937. <laughs> well, I'd hope to keep that a secret, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> Sophie Tucker's been wearing herself out coaching me, so I guess I'll have to go through with it after all. Well, there's no time like the present. Oh, no. No, no, no. There's only one singer on this program, and that's you, Irene. Now, what's it going to be? Oh, well, I don't know. Do you think it's a good idea, Mr. DeMille? A great idea. <laughs> uh, why not a song from your new Paramount picture, High, Wide, and Handsome? Well, all right. I'll sing The Folks Who Live on the Hill by Mr. Kern and Oscar Hammerstein. Great, Irene. Thanks, Bob. And now just a word about the people who are behind this program. I think we owe them a great deal, not only for the entertainment they provide, but for a beauty care so thoroughly reliable as Lux Toilet Soap. Water and Lux Soap are all anyone needs to keep a clear, healthy complexion. I'm glad to say that. And sorry I must say good night. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Come back soon, both of you. You heard her on the screen. Starring in such hits as Private Worlds, It Happened One Night, Cleopatra, The Bride Comes Home, and Maid of Salem. You heard her three times from our stage. And next Monday night, your countless requests bring her back once again when the Lux Radio Theater presents Paramount's lovely star, Miss Claudette Colbert, in Hands Across the Table by Vinya Del Mar. With Miss Colbert in this delightful comedy is one of Hollywood's favorite sons, Mr. Joel McRae. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Claudette Colbert and Joel McRae with Walter Pigeon in Hands Across the Table. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNX, the Columbia Station, Los Angeles.